Welcome to Missing and Not Forgotten, the official podcast of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. I'm Sean Everett, DPAA's Media Relations Chief and your host. Thank you for joining us. Our guest on this episode is Dr. Tim McMahon. He leads the amazing lab DPAA partners with to analyze DNA from recovered remains, one of our most important lines of evidence in making identifications. Tim, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. I really appreciate you being here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I am uh, Dr. Timothy McMahon. I am the director of DOD DNA operations for the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System. Uh, I oversee two units within the what we're going to call the AFMES, which is the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System. I oversee the Armed Forces Repository of Specimen Samples for the Identification of Remains, or AFISIR. We're just going to call it the repository. That houses all of the DNA reference cards that we have collected since 1992 for all of our active duty reserve and National Guard service members. So now, if somebody is killed in a current theater of operation, we have that direct reference card. We do not have that. We'll talk more about this later that opportunity for any of our fallen heroes from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, or the Cold War. We didn't know about DNA then. The other unit I oversee is the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory, or AFDIL. AFDIL houses all of my DNA scientists, and we have three main missions there. We have current day operations that um, has 12 very highly talented scientists that do all of the current day DNA testing. So these are any service members killed in current theaters of operation, training accidents, or federal exclusive land. Then I have my past accounting section. So this directly supports the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. I have 87 scientists assigned to that unit that does all of the DNA testing for DPAA. My other section is my family reference section. And so this has another 12 scientists that are assigned to that. And remember, current day, I have that direct reference from the service member. For World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the Cold War, I do not have a direct reference. We didn't know about DNA there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So we have to rely on DNA that comes down through either the mother's side, called mitochondrial DNA, or the Y chromosome, which comes down through the father's side, or we can do modern DNA testing methods called autosomal short tandem repeats. And basically what we do is we look for references that are either from mother, father, brother, sisters, or children as the missing service members. And we basically can do sibling tests or paternity tests. And that's what we do to support DPA. We are a, um, as the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System, we are a unit of one within the Department of Defense. There is no other DNA testing lab or medical examiner system that can determine the cause and manner of death. Um, And that's us in a nutshell of who we are and what we do. Right, you're able to shrink it down to a pretty succinct thing, but it's a a way bigger operation. You know, I remember going to your lab a couple years ago, and it's uh, it's amazing the things that you all can do up there. So, we've talked. You mentioned FRS, family reference samples. We have talked about that in some of the previous episodes of the podcast. Dive into that a little bit for me. We never got into a lot of great detail, so dive into that a little bit for me. So. So let's let's take a walk back through history now, okay? So during World War II, at the end of World War II, we had no idea what DNA was. Sure, we knew scientifically that there was a genetic material within in animals and stuff that passed information on. We've all learned about it in, in high school and stuff, Gregor Mendel and genetics. But it wasn't until the end of the Korean War, 1953, that Watson and Crick who won the Nobel Prize, actually were able to define DNA, show its structure and everything. Now, our ability to Google Translate DNA, so, you know, to be able to read DNA, didn't come around until 1975, 1976, under um, Fred Sanger, who developed one method to Google Translate. We call it Sanger sequencing. Or we had Maxim and Gilbert, who developed another way to do it. And that was right at the end of the Vietnam War. 
1984 was a big year for us uh, within the United States uh, for two reasons. Uh, President Reagan opened up diplomatic relationships with Vietnam for the first time since the, since the end of the war, and we received, the DPA and its predecessors received unknown fallen heroes at that point. But Sir Alec Jeffries actually defined elements within DNA that are passed down through families to individuals that were able to identify, and those became what we called short tandem repeats. Our ability to Xerox copy DNA came about in 1987 as the polymerase chain reaction. So that allowed us to take very little pieces of DNA and copy them. It's kind of like putting a sheet of paper in and hitting 300 copies. That's what we do. So in 1991, we actually used DNA for the first time, mitochondrial DNA, to assist with the identification of one of these unknowns from Vietnam. And that kind of set the pace going forward. However, I have an unknown sample that comes from the DPAA, bone, tooth, generated DNA profile. I don't have a direct reference. So how do I match? Right, because that blood card, they didn't start doing that till later. No, they had no idea, right? It wasn't until 1991, actually. So in 1991, I just said we, had, we used DNA to assist with the identification of Vietnam unknown. At the end of the Gulf War, we actually had to use DNA because we could not identify individuals by fingerprint or dental, so we had to use DNA. That set up the repository and how we started FRSs in 1992. So what we learned over time is that there are two types of DNA within your body. There are these energy producing cells just like batteries, they're called mitochondrion. They contain DNA that only comes down through the mother. So if, the, if your mother had three sisters and you're the missing service member and you're an only child, your aunt has the same mitochondrial DNA as you, your maternal aunt, and your maternal niece or nephew would have the same mitochondrial DNA. So that is a family reference that we can go after. Now, when you think of male versus female, your mom and dad, you're born. If you're a male, you have an X and a Y chromosome. That Y chromosome is passed down through the father's side. So if you're the missing service member and your father had three paternal uncles and they had sons, so paternal nephews, they become viable references. And when they marry, a paternal grandnephew from the missing service member would have the same Y chromosome. So using genealogists, we can track down and find what we call a viable living family reference. And then we ask them to donate to us and we put it into a searchable database in real time. So that when we get this unknown sample and we know it's in the blind, we know it's from Vietnam, we can search the Vietnam database. So. How does that help? When you think about the total number of missing people, we, we could talk 82,000 people. And let's take a bite out of this. At the end of the Korean War, there were 8,100 missing service members. We started collecting references for Korea in 1992. And as of today, I have 92% of those missing 8,100 service members, so about 7,700 and change, I have a reference for in the database. That's because, amazing. Because of that high number, we can make associations very quickly. Now, when you deal with an FRS, there are some limitations. When you talk about the maternal or mitochondrial DNA, because it is what we call a lineage marker, there are common sequences when you look at only small pieces of the mitochondrial DNA. I tell people to think about mitochondrial DNA like a clock, because it's circular. And we look at a very small region between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., and we call that the control region. 90% of your mitochondrial DNA codes for essential functions. So when you have changes, it's high, it, it, we call it the hypervariable region in that because it can, it can absorb these changes without causing birth defects or, or anything like that. So within that small region, my DNA, Dr. McMahon's mitochondrial DNA, 
is the most consistent, most common type. So I match 7% of all Caucasian people. <laughs> So if you think of that a, makes things a little difficult sometimes. It does, right? So you think of a hundred people lost in a battle, seven of those at a minimum could share a common mitochondrial DNA sequence. However, I have a different father than those other seven people. So just like a giant jigsaw puzzle, I use mitochondrial DNA to establish the borders, and then I have a bone that has a common sequence, and I've limited it to four people, and those four people have paternal references. I then do YSTR testing, or Y short tandem repeat, and I exclude three of those people, but include one. We have now made that association to assist with an identification. So there's a lot that goes into it, and so time has changed the landscape of how we attack different things. You, um, because of the, the methods that we utilize, it used to take five grams of a bone, and then we could not dissolve all the bones until we developed a new method in 2006. And that allowed us to dissolve the bone completely and free up all of the DNA that was in it. So instead of five grams, I only need... 0.2 grams, so very small pieces right, of bone. Right, so you, very little can generate an ID then. Yes, but that allowed us to get not just mitochondrial DNA, it allowed us to get that single nuclear DNA, and that's the DNA you get half from mom, half from dad. Now we can do a combined statistic. So if we have references from the brother of the missing service member, and we have a lot of references from brothers and sisters. Either way, if we get that, we can now do a combined statistic. I'll give you an example. One of the identifications that recently was made, if we only had mitochondrial DNA, it would be 1,200 times more likely. Again, closed population. Don't want to go to court with that for a criminal case, but in a missing person, that's, that means it's a unique mitochondrial DNA. Right. But we had the brother and sister, so we did Y chromosomal testing, linked it to the brother but we also did autosomal what we did autosomal and did sibling testing and when we did the combined statistic it was over a billion times more likely and i've read that in our medical examiner reports because they put your report in into that as for the overall id and it's it always it always sort of made me grin or chuckle when i would read no oh, this was a thousand times likely to be Related, and then when you put the other kinds in there, the the autosomal and the YSTR, yeah, a billion times more likely. And I'm like, that's a pretty good chance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, again, we we um, what I what I need people to think about is when they think about how we support the DPAA, it is a past accounting mission. So unlike modern crime scene labs, where which where, where I've worked and, and helped with. If I was to break into your house and I left blood there, the question is, who broke into your house against the world's population of 7.9 billion people? So it's a wide open population. So that's why you need that direct reference from the, the suspect and the perpetrator sample so that you can link it and get a very high statistic. Right, right. When you're doing a past accounting mission, we have a close population. Now, it could be a close population of 8,100, everyone from... But if you take a B-24 loss from World War II and you know that half of the crew parachuted out and only three of the crew members were left in the plane. Right, it starts narrowing It's a very down. closed population. Yeah. So you can use these lineage markers. So if all three of them have different mitochondrial DNA sequences and you link them to their references, it supports the identification. It's vastly different. However, we're running into... With our samples, when we extract the DNA, so dissolve the bone and get the DNA, I wish I had a magic eight ball that just said, give me the human DNA. <laughs> Unfortunately, right. I get every type of DNA in there, bacterial, fungal, parasitic, human. And unlike a modern sample where I could take a cheek swab from, from, from you, Sean, right. um, where it would have huge amount of human DNA, and then some very low-level bacterial, normal bacterial DNA that we have in our body. 
here I have huge amounts of bacterial, fungal, parasite, and very little bits of human DNA. And to compound that, we have a number of samples that have been chemically preserved to go to burial. And specific ones of those, we've actually worked with uh, a lab that does testing of Neanderthal DNA because that's how we develop our methods. We're developing to go after these highly damaged samples that the yeah. DNA has. Yeah. And we were able to show that these samples are as damaged as 40,000-year-old Neanderthal oh my DNA. Gosh. So we have to develop methods that are vastly different than a modern way to do things. Right. Um, and because of that, we're also, as time goes on, we're getting FRSs from that the only living family member is a paternal niece. None of our modern methods can do that testing right now. Right. So if you've ever done 23andMe or Ancestry.com, right. we have developed a method that is similar to theirs, but we had to develop it ourselves because remember, I have to get that very little bit of human DNA. It's right. not like spitting into a cup and right, having tons right. of human. So we have been very, very successful in developing uh, methods that allow us to capture that human DNA. And so we basically develop a um, bait, we call it. So it's like putting a worm on a hook to get a fish. Well, we have a bait that captures the nuclear DNA or the mitochondrial DNA. Oh, that's fascinating. And that bait has a metal molecule on it that we bind to it. And we can use a magnet to pull the human or enrich for the human DNA. Oh, wow. And so that allows us to get the results that we want. And so we were uh, hoping, so like it, it's called, uh, the, the buzzwords in the field are forensic investigative genetic genealogy or FIG. Um, they used it to catch the Golden State Killer. They're using it to do um, cold cases now. Um, those commercial methods we tried back in 2015, 16, and we thought it was going to be great. You know, out of 850,000 markers, we thought we would get it to work. For without, sure, get something. Get something. We got 40,000 markers out of 850,000, which can't do anything. So we had to develop our own. We were hoping to bring it on in uh, October, but as we have to validate, so we have to do a forensic validation for our accreditation, so we're accredited just like your state and local crime lab, we have to show it's reproducible, reliable, and robust. But then we also had to develop our own software for it, and we had to develop our own method. So as we started pushing it, and more and more, we started seeing that some of the databases, we were potentially... Um, having some issues. So we step back, we're reassessing it now, and we'll probably bring it on November, December of this year, so about a month after we thought. But it, it will increase the success rate overall. Excellent. So, that's, I mean, and that's what everybody wants. The, the higher the success rate, the more likely well, we are to get a positive ID. And, and you bring up a good point. So those chemically treated samples, right? We, we, we cracked the shell in 2016 took us 16 years to do it for those Korea punch bowl samples to capture that that DNA is if you think that the modern short tandem repeat right that takes about anywhere from one inch pieces of DNA all the way up to the to complete DNA right the DNA from these chemically treated are half an inch so they don't work with these modern so we had to do that capture right method. right when we first brought it online is the first lab to do a next generation sequencing method we could do three to four samples per month with a success rate about 23 percent so now you're looking at we are, are eight years later on this we've had it eight years we've gone through four optimizations major optimizations and we are averaging 120 samples per month now instead of three and our success rate is 68 to 72 percent, depending on the sample in the region. So we've gone from three to four samples and a 24 percent success rate up to 120 per month. So now is that just because of, of iteration and knowing how to look at it better or knowing how to get what you get what you need out of the samples better? It's a combination of everything. So we monitor our success rates every month. So we're reporting out about 300 analyses, and so an analysis could be any of those tests. Um, but we have to do those in duplicate before we can report them out. So it's more like 600 analyses. But our success rates 
if they start to drop, we start to reassess what the sample is. How do we increase our success rate, reduce the steps to get to increasing, and how do we prevent contamination? So part of it is the reiteration, part of it is uh, through optimization, part of it is um, I work with the company called Illumina, who, who makes the initial NGS instrument that we bought, and they made a larger throughput instrument um, that was more for medical diagnostics. And um, in chatting with them, uh, they were very, very helpful to us. We talked for about six months. Um, they, were, they didn't want to sell us an instrument that wasn't geared for forensics because of how they wanted to honor the mission. But eventually, they said, okay, we see your method. We see what you're doing. You're using the same stuff we do for the medical diagnostics, the same cassette that we would do. And they sold it to us. And that allowed us to go from only putting seven samples onto an instrument to being able to run um, 24 samples, so a threefold increase. Yeah. And, and, then, and then it took, instead of 40, you know, over 40 hours to run, it only took 20, 28 hours, let's say, to run. So, it's speeding so you're up. running more and going faster. Yeah. And, and we got better analytics and we got more people trained. And if we increase our first pass success rates, then we're getting more samples through and we're 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 doing all of that. Absolutely. So one of the things that I know I've heard you talk about in the past that I want to address for those who may be listening who've never had the good fortune to be able to hear you give one of your talks at one of our family member updates or annual government briefings. The family reference samples that we take, the FRS, some people are hesitant mm -hmm. to give the government their mm -hmm. DNA. Mm -hmm. Talk about the protections that go into that for the past conflict mission. Absolutely. So, again, you know, people associate us as a crime lab because we use the same type of um, testing that they do. And we have a database. However, our database is a secured database. So when you sign our form, because we fall under the Defense Health Agency, we've always been the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System. Since day one, those are protected under HIPAA. Okay, so that's the same statement when you go to the doctor, Sean, and they say, okay, you know, you're going to sign. Right, right. The, the informed consent is very specific. It says that you, the donor, understand that you're going to give us your DNA, nuclear DNA, mitochondrial, and that we will run it, you know, against a viable test within our lab, and that you give us the right to put that into a database to be used only for the identification of your missing hero, okay? Because of that, that database is secured. Even DPAA scientists don't have access to it. The Armed Forces Medical Exam, the docs downstairs don't have access to it. The only people who have access to my database are my staff who have been signed off through their training and myself and so that's how we protect it. So even an outside agency coming in, like a, a crime agency or, a, you know, a local crime, they can't search it because of the way that it was set up and the way that we collected it. It can only be utilized to identify your missing service member. Well, that's good because if we can get that word out there, then hopefully the people who are hesitant right. because they're afraid that anybody will be able to, to look at their DNA, nope. hopefully they'd be more and, likely to give a sample. And the big thing that, that everyone has to do is we're not like um, – when you do a test through 23andMe and Ancestry.com, they're looking at a large number of targets, over 850,000 targets. You know, some of those targets are identity targets, so they tell you who you're related to and, and, and mm -hmm. how based on relationships and, and stuff shared right. and runs. And some of it tells you your ancestry, where you've come from, how you're related. But there are genetic predictors of disease markers in there as well. Yep. Okay. We, when we look at mitochondrial DNA... We're not a genetic diagnostic laboratory. So when you do a short tandem repeat or an STR test, those are non-disease predicting markers. They're basically outside of what we call the uh, the coding region or that region we call an open reading frame. So think of a sentence. 
if he, if the sentence says the cat is red and I take the T off and you tried it's he and everything shifted one, you're not gonna be able to read it, okay? So we are outside of that. So it doesn't code for genetic disease. The mitochondrial DNA, although we sequence the whole mitochondrial genome, we don't look at disease predictive markers in it. And so our databases don't have that type of information in it. Um, when we're looking at our SNP, that single nucleotide polymorphism test, the one that we're just gonna bring online, we stayed away from those type of markers. We pulled in only ancestry markers and identity markers. So that's another security in there. Even, you know, those you have to have a whole different type of software to it. So we don't have that type of information. But it is secured and only my people have access to it. That's good to know. I have heard that before, but it's good to mm -hmm. let everybody else who might be listening know mm -hmm. just so that if they need to give, if we're trying to find one of their service members and they're just they're hesitant to give that DNA, that uh, hopefully knowing that it's secure yep. and it won't be used for anything else. And then we, we take it one step further. So when we receive the sample into our lab, that in one part of our laboratory information management system, it's where we document everything, the donor gets linked with the missing service member in ours, and it, and that sample gets its own unique case number. So for example, 2024F, so year 2024, F for family reference, and then the next successive number. Um, and that is the number that goes through the lab, not their name, that unique number. And that unique number is what is entered into the database. And you have to have two parts of our computer system to link them together. Gotcha. Okay. So we do keep it, we, we, we what we call um, anonymize the sample. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good, good, good. So that's really all that all that I have to ask you about. Is there anything that we didn't touch on? Maybe something that you guys have coming up? Some neat new so technology. We, so we, we talked about the we talked about the SNPs. That's the newest one that we're we're coming online with. It's a little too early to talk about some other stuff that we're looking at. We uh, I think the biggest thing to understand is under the Armed Forces Medical Examiner system, we've been partnered with DPAA. Um, as their DNA testing laboratory within DOD since 1991. There is a, a medical examiner who is out at the DPAA uh, to do a scientific finding of identification. I think what people need to understand is that there is a constant communication between our laboratories in Hawaii and Offit with my lab. We, we talk every day. We have cases for ID meetings where we're, we have 20 scientists on the phone on teams and we're reviewing the case the anthropologist talks the dna people they talk about the dna we review that case so that there are multiple different eyes looking at this and i think that's something people may miss is the the level of communication and interaction that we do i think people think that we're separated and we just don't talk that much and we talk every day on this right we may be separate agencies but we are tight partners in this mission and have been for decades at this point point. and i think the one thing people also need to understand is their uh, to honor our fallen heroes whether you're talking about the DPA lab in Hawaii or off it, or you're talking about AFDIL, we don't give up. We are constantly evolving new methods. And both of our laboratories typically are, are five to 10 years ahead of your state and local labs when we're doing this stuff. But just because we didn't get a result in 1998 on a sample doesn't mean we give up on that sample. As we develop new methods, we meet and talk again. There are IDs that are coming out from samples that were initially tested in 98, then in 2008, and they didn't work. And all of a sudden, with the new methods, they're working. We don't give up. And I think that's the method. message sometimes that we don't get out there enough is we don't give up. We reassess. We come back. Right. Yeah. The fact that just because it doesn't work now doesn't mean it won't work in the future. Yep. And, and we keep that going. Well, Tim, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And I know that our listeners will uh, will appreciate the the sort of I guess a little bit deeper dive into the into the world of DNA because it's such an important part of bringing our service members home. So thanks. 
My pleasure, and it's a great mission, great partners, um, and anything we can do to, to help people understand how unique this mission is, how different it is from what you see on TV, but why it's important to do this. And, and I think you as a veteran understand this more than anything. When we say we will leave no one behind, that because we're a 100% volunteer service, our young, our young men and women are standing up saying, I will defend you. We have an honor to go get them. Thanks again, Dr. McMahon. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that deeper look into the world of DNA that makes so many of our identifications possible. This has been Missing and Not Forgotten, DPAA's official podcast. Please join us for our next episode where we'll begin a three-episode arc about Marine Captain Ron Forrester, who is accounted for from the Vietnam War at the end of 2023.